There are some things in life that we can only grasp a fraction of. And let me give you some details or some, some examples of what I mean by there are things that we can only grasp a small portion of. And it's, and it's what it is, is it's our eyes can only see so much. You know, in reality, we know the world is multidimensional, but our eyes perceive things rather flat. Uh, and the perception that we gain from that is very limited. We can also only comprehend so much with our minds. Our minds only have the ability to understand so much at one time. And because of those limitations, there are things that we see or that we experience that we don't fully know how to grasp. So let me start with a couple of pictures here. Let's throw our first picture up. I believe it's the Rocky Mountains if I have my... Yeah, the Rocky Mountains. Anyone seen the Rocky Mountains? Raise your hands good and high. Okay. Out in this part of the country, it's all the Appalachians. And let's be honest, they're just big rolling hills compared to the, the Rockies. If you've ever been to the Rockies, and particularly if you've driven to the Rockies, and I'll, just, I'll describe it for you in a picture, you're driving across Kansas, and Kansas is as flat as this floor. This building was built by Dadisman, so I trust that it was pretty flat. I, mean, I trust that this is a level area. You know, he was good at that. But you're driving across Kansas, and there is nothing. But once you get to the border of Colorado, something magical happens. Just like I saw Brad say, it goes just like this. And it's majestic. And it's one of those things that, that I can throw a picture up here on the screen and you're going to look at it and your eyes are going to see it in what's considered two-dimensional. You're only seeing a, you're seeing a flat screen. But the day that you actually make that drive or the day that you take an airplane, even when you're flying over, the flight over doesn't really, is, is anticlimactic. You're looking down, you're like, well, that's the Rockies and that's nothing to write home about. But when you start driving through them and the snow is falling on the road to the side and you're curving your way up these hills and your ears are starting to pop because of the pressure. The mountains take on a whole different perspective. It's even different though when you go to the Grand Canyon. Oh, how many of you have seen a picture of the Grand Canyon? Now if you haven't before, here's your first picture. If you have before, this is a small picture of the Grand Canyon. Now, how many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Uh, we've got a few more hands that time. The first time, for those of you who have been there, the first time you went to the Grand Canyon, what was your thought? Wow. Amazing. You know, when you see a picture of the Grand Canyon, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful place. And, and then you're looking, I mean, I'm looking at this picture, I say, man, that is, that's a pretty place. You know, I, I don't know how far across that is, but, you know, you, you know it, it, looks, it doesn't look that grand. It looks pretty, but it's, it doesn't look that amazing until you're standing on the edge of that south rim. A little town, I think it's called Williamsburg, you typically go to. It's one of the areas you can go to. And when you're standing at the edge of that south rim and you're looking north, and you realize that you're talking 10 miles plus maybe before you reach the other side. When you're looking across and you can see nothing, I mean, it's just, it's this expanse that is so much just, and it's all colored in the most beautiful colors of sand in a sense. These reds and these greens and these, these hues that you see. And it's just absolutely beautiful. And then people, has anyone been to the north rim of the Grand Canyon? It's far less visited. Steve went to the north. They say the north is far more beautiful than the south. And I imagine just, just to think as you stand at the north rim and you're looking across the Grand Canyon. When I was younger, my parents always, we always kind of lived out in the country. Um, my dad had a habit of buying rough land out in the middle of nowhere because it was cheap. And we would, he had a couple of boys, and so the boys' job was to Haul, had to move rocks and then haul sticks and burn sticks. That was our job. So we made the land sellable so he could sell it and buy another two-acre plot. But we always lived out in the country. 
There were never street lights. There, there weren't. There wasn't the hustle and bustle of city life. And then when I was a teenager, I moved in with my mom, and my mom lived on 40 acres, way out of town. You go to the middle of nowhere, and then you go a little bit further, and you found it. And so, I remember as a teenager looking up and seeing a picture of the starry night. And this picture that I found doesn't really even do it justice. Some of you may have grown up a little bit out in the country, out in the sticks. Some of you may have even visited places where you could get away from the ambient light and you could actually see the stars. You could could see all that was there. But I'm going to guess that many of you never have. Many of you have probably always lived near a street light. And no offense to street lights, they just seem to ruin the mood. When you look up, at the sky. You're laying in the bed of your pickup truck and you're just looking up. and All you see are just flakes of salt in the sky against the black backdrop. You begin to realize how small you are in this grand scheme of things. Oftentimes we think of ourselves as pretty big. I mean, we are the peak of intelligence, are we not? I mean, the human is far more intelligent than so many other animals. We're far more advanced than so many creatures. And yet, as I look at these three spaces, I realize how how small we are. But really, how infinitely we are, how... Not infinite, that's a bad word. How poorly, there we go, that's the word I'm looking for. We actually perceive things. Because the universe that we live in is majestic and beautiful. The Grand Canyon has this wow factor that we can't really grasp until you're standing there. And the Rockies carry that same idea of excitement and of just awe that you can only see and can only experience when you're driving across the plains of Kansas and you reach that border to Colorado or to Montana. That is the imagery that I want you to have as we go into Ephesians today. So as we start in Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to begin, I want to jump back to 14 for a moment just to kind of build us some context here. And then I want us to jump to 18 and 19. This is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now, as we as we've started 2023 off, I'm using Ephesians chapter 3, this prayer in particular, as the example of the path that I want us to set for 2023. And the first thing that I mentioned was that, that we are people of prayer. Paul says he was on his knees in prayer. Secondly, verse 16, that according to the riches of His glory, we may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner beings. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you would be rooted and grounded in love. And then secondly, I said that we have to be people that are rooted, that we are anchored in love. And so as we embark into 2023, those are some of the concepts that I want us to keep. Those are concepts that I want us to hold to. That we are people that are anchored in love. That we are fervent in our prayer life. But then as we hit now verse 18, that you're rooted and grounded in love, verse 18, that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Primarily verse 18. When you're looking at the Rocky Mountains, the Grand Canyon, when you're looking at the stars up in the sky, whatever you need to do to grasp the concept that the world is so much bigger, so much more dimensional than what we're used to, I want you to hold that thought and realize that when we come to verse 18, that's what Paul's saying. 
when we get into verse 18, what Paul is saying is the world of God is far more dimensional than what we typically think. You see, oftentimes, we are guilty of putting God into a rather small box. We like to think of Him in ways that we can perceive. And that makes sense. You know why? Because I, I can't grasp something that I can't grasp. If I told you to think of a number that was so big you can't think of it, could you physically do it? It's, uh, it's, if it's a number that's too big for you to think about, well, it's, you can't, you, I can't ask you to think about it. You know, it's a kind of an oxymoron. Isn't that the right, is that the right grammatical term? Linguistic term? Whatever term that would be. I think that's the right term. It, it goes beyond our comprehension. And so, when Paul is coming in here in verse 18, and he says, I want you to think, I want you to have the strength to comprehend the breadth, length, height, and depth. It's like looking at a picture of the Grand Canyon versus experiencing the Grand Canyon. When you look at a picture, that's what you got. It's flat. You, you can see the dimension to it. Your eye can imagine the dimension to it. And you can create an idea of it. But it's not until you're standing at the edge of it and you're looking out over it that you're actually able to experience some of the dimension to it. The same is true whenever you go hiking in the mountains. You can see a picture of the Rockies, and when you see it, your eyes can see it and you say, oh, that's pretty. And we have this dimension that of flatness. But when you start hiking up the mountain, and you've got your backpack on, and you're crossing a stream, and you're seeing the snow, and you're feeling the environment, that, that's when you have the dimension of the length, width, height, and depth of what the Rockies are. You could call the Appalachians if you want to. I don't care what mountain range you go to. But when you see the dimension of it. And so what Paul starts off with here in his prayer is he says, I pray, I ask God. And, and I'm, I'm asking you, I'm asking for God to give you the strength now mind you, when Paul says strength, it's not this kind of strength that we're talking about here. When Paul says strength, it's not like do you have a muscle over here. You know, it's, it's not like you're a bodybuilder. Paul is saying, he says, I hope you have the mental fortitude. I hope that your mind can grasp the idea. Let me tell you an example. Anyone in math remember imaginary numbers? I got a couple of hands up top. Y'all remember the imaginary numbers? Anyone, anyone not hear of imaginary numbers? I don't know. Some of y'all, some of y'all are looking at me like I have like flown off the coop. Y'all have never heard of it? Okay, so let me tell you. So when you get to algebra, algebra is where you have x plus y equals something. That's basic algebra. Okay, like algebra somewhat makes sense. Because you know there's a number and, and then these letters have to mean a number and you're trying to find out what the number is. Imaginary numbers, apparently it's like a negative exponent. Who's smart enough to remember what imaginary numbers are? <laughs> what are they? Square root of negative one. I do not have, let me just go and tell you, this is where I'm break to the point. I do not have the mental fortitude to understand imaginary numbers. It's the one part of algebra that I failed. Poetry is the same. Poetry is a great, people ask you to write poetry. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like poetry for some people. It, I do not lack the mental, I lack, I lack, I lack the mental fortitude to understand imaginary numbers. I took counseling classes in college. Those were some of my worst college classes. I think that's pretty bad for the camp for the preacher, but that's some of my worst classes. I lack the mental fortitude to understand counseling theory. And Paul is saying, I pray, I ask, I bet that you would have the strength, the mental fortitude to comprehend. And when he says comprehend, it's not like, oh, I got it. I know how to. I know how to bake mama's recipe. I know how to bake grandma's cake. It's not this simple, I got it. When he says comprehend, it's like a bear hug. He says, I pray that you've got the mental fortitude 
to bear hug the idea. Okay, so if y'all want an image of that, and you can actually do it with me, you got the mental fortitude to bear hug the love of God. That's what he's saying. Except, except I kind of jumped out of context there because he says, I pray that you have the mental fortitude to bear hug with all that you are, the length, width, height, and depth of the love of God for you. I pray that you could do that. Now, we could start breaking some of these dimensions down really quickly, and I can realize that in life, there are people who love me immensely. I want you to think of a person who loves you immensely. Or maybe someone you love immensely. Immensely means a lot, if you didn't know. Maybe it's a mama. Boy, mamas tend to love, don't they? Mamas tend to love. Maybe it's a daddy. Daddies, they tend to care for their babies, don't they? Maybe it's, maybe it's a spouse, husband or wife. Maybe it's a significant other, just a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Maybe it's an aunt or an uncle, a niece or a nephew. Maybe, maybe the person you're thinking of right now is so very close to you. They're in your heart. And I want you to ask this question. How much Do you love them? There's a little lady who would have been sitting over there today. Everett was up every 30 minutes last night. It was an awful night as a parent, one of those nights. So she's not here. There's a little lady over there that, I don't know, 10-ish years ago, whenever we decided to get serious about getting married, she said, I will move to the middle of a desert for you. She did. said, I love you enough. I'll go through the pains of carrying a kid. Childbirth. She did. Boy, I love you enough. I'll I'll go through it with you. We'll, We'll challenge life together. I got a mom and a daddy. I got a mom and a daddy. You know what mamas and daddies sacrificed so that I could be standing here right now? I can't begin to imagine what my dad and my mom have done so that I could have the life that I've got. And I now have the privilege to get to do that for my boy. But I get to look at them and I get to say, what what do I get to sacrifice? What, What do I get to put off What do I get to endure so that I can give you the best that life has to offer? And when it comes to love, does any of the sacrifice really hurt? No. When it comes to love, I will welcome whatever the pain is. I will welcome whatever the journey is. I will welcome the climb. I will welcome the fight. I will welcome it because it's in a spirit of love for who they are. I will walk. Well, I will walk 500 miles. That's a song, a little popular song. I will walk a thousand miles. Is that what it is? I will walk 500. I will walk whatever the journey is. There is nothing that could separate me from the people whom I love. Some of you have kissed goodbye for a final time some of the people you love dearly. And when you've kissed that final kiss, did you really say goodbye? Or were you saying, I'll see you later? Because oftentimes, even in those moments, love still lasts. It's still there. And when we come to this concept of understanding the length, width, height, and breadth, breadth, length, width, height, whatever those four words are, of the love of God, 
I realize that there is absolutely nothing, as Paul would say, that can separate me from the love of God. You see, I could look at the breadth, the width, and I could ask, how far away can I go that God would not love me? How far could I run and His love not somehow be there for me? If you want a good example of this, I want you to think of the parable of the uh, prodigal son. If you don't know the story, one son goes to the father and he says, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my money. And he takes his money and he runs. And he spends it on all of his friends, a whole bunch of harlots. He lives the life he's always dreamed of living. And then when he comes back to dad because he's found rock bottom, he's got nothing left. Dad is the one who goes and meets him. And says, I love you. The son ran as far away from him as possible, but dad was still waiting right there for him. Dad was still loving him. How far could we ever get away when God would say, I no longer love you? Is there a distance? Is there a place where you could run to? Is, is there a place that we could go to where we could say that I've gone so far high that God cannot find me? Or even in the Old Testament, the concept was always, could I go down to the depths of the grave and a place that God would not find me? Could I go somewhere where your love would not search me out? And the Old Testament is filled with examples of time where people have said, if I go to the depths, if I go to the grave, if I go to hell, you are there loving still. I realize that this question of the multidimensional quality of God's love is that even in the highs and the lows, in the fars and the nears, God's love is still there. If you want an example of how God's love will go to the depths, read Philippians chapter 2. Jesus Christ, being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, if you can remember the text. Paul is writing and he says that Jesus, even though He was God, He considered it robbery, some translations would say, to be called God. And so He took the form of a bondservant and came to earth. Jesus Christ, who had the, the crown of glory, who lived in heaven, what did He do? He said, I will give this up for you. I will sacrifice it all for you. I will walk away from it all. I will walk 500 miles. I will walk 500 miles more. I will do it again and again and again. And ultimately, I will die on a cross for you. I think, friends, and this is my major point for the day, I think the major problem, the, depth, the, the, the deficit in Christianity is that we fail to think properly the love of Christ. I think that our biggest problem is that we fail to realize how much we are loved. And let me give you an example of why I think that way. Too often, when things don't go my way, what do I do? I walk away. When I didn't get what I wanted, when God didn't answer my prayer the way I wanted Him to do it, when my life isn't as good as I wished it had been, what do I do? Well, God, why do I can't believe. How dare you? And God all along plays the part of the lover who chases after and says, but I love you. And I realize that my biggest problem as a Christian, I'm sharing this for me, and I hope it fits for you. I don't hope it fits for you, but I'm sure it does. Is that I don't ponder, I don't meditate, I don't, I don't dwell. I don't, uh, what was my phrase? I don't have the mental fortitude to grasp, you know, to wrestle. The concept of how much I am loved by God. 
So friends, here's my challenge for you. Life's tough. There are things that just make it even more difficult. But when you know that someone loves you, all of a sudden the challenges become more worth a fight, don't they? When, when you know that you're going to be missed, fighting through rehab makes a little more sense, doesn't it? If you know that you're going to be a vegetable in a bed somewhere, unable to do anything, but you know you got a family who loves you and they want better for you, they want something for you, and you have the capability to do it, you're going to fight for it. You know that if you can have the opportunity to fight for the betterment of your life, for your family, for those whom you love, you will fight for it. Because that's what we do in love. Jesus fought for you on a cross, on a mountain called Calvary, so that you could have everything that you ever needed in a spiritual world. So that you could have spiritual life. So that you could have spiritual joy. He did all that He could do for you. I know what I would do for Ashley because I love her. I know what I've done. I don't really keep track of it. I probably just go through some lists. But, but I know what I would continue to do because I love her. I know what I would do for my boys because I love them. I know what I've done for them. I know what I'm going to continue to do. And I look forward to the opportunities to do more for them. You know, I love you. Each one of you. I look forward to the ways that I can even give for you. Because I love you. You're my church. I look forward to the ways that I can sacrifice for you. Why don't I do the same for God? If I look at the way that God loved me, loves me, present tense, and I look at the ways that He would give, that He would sacrifice, that He would move heaven and earth for me, what can I do for Him? Gary has our application prayer this morning. I think it's Gary. Is it, am I right, Gary? Yeah, good. <laughs> I said that and I thought, oh no, am I wrong? Gary has our application prayer. I'm going to ask Gary to come on up and pray for us. And my prayer, about my request for that is to be simple. That we would ponder, would meditate, and would hold to the love that God has for us more and more. Father, we have many who are sick among our number. They aren't able to be here today. We ask your healing for them. We have many who are living in sin, and we all sin, Father, and we ask your forgiveness for that. But, Father, one thing we don't have to ask for is for you to love us more, for you are love. And that love will cover us from now through eternity. And we praise you for that and thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.